You can then connect the integrated heat spread on there and then clamp it down using your motherboard's pressure. So now to the juicy part of the video, the results. We're talking like at least a 20 degree drop here and not only that, higher overclocks. When I did my i7 7700K uh, review, I could only get this thing to 4.9 gigahertz. Though after I delitted it, I could now get it to 5.1 gigahertz and I could even boot into Windows and get to the OS screen before it crashed at 5.2 gigahertz. Now keep in mind, I would give it more voltage, but it is really hot at the moment. This is at 33 or 32 degrees at the moment. So the temperatures are ridiculously hot in here and I still managed to pull off a 5.1 gigahertz overclock. And looking at the temperatures, this is probably the most important part when you delid. Uh, when I was benchmarking at 4.9 gigahertz before I delitted, this thing was going near 100 degrees. It was going well over 90 degrees, completely not recommended to anyone out there for 24 seven operation. Though after I delitted, this thing was sitting around 80 degrees at 5.1 gigahertz. So the difference is huge, uh, not only for the temperatures, but also for 24 seven stable operation. And also if you guys want to get a higher overclock out of your Cabby Lake CPUs. Now, one thing I will discuss with this is that it's really crazy because you wouldn't think with, uh, as the generations of CPUs go on, Intel would put better thermal paste on these CPUs, but I don't think they are. I mean, with the Haswell refresh, they kind of did get it right with the thermal paste on those chips where the temperatures were a lot lower than the previous two generations before that. But it seems like with Cabby Lake, they've done it again where they've just put cheap thermal paste on. And this stuff is really cheap. When I deleted the CPU, this stuff was like rubber. So anyway guys, to sum things up quickly, if you are getting a Cabby Lake CPU and you do want to overclock, then I can highly recommend deleting this thing and getting not only higher overclocks, but much better temperatures. So I'll put some links in the description below if you want to get some of the gear. Though keep in mind, some of these D-Lid kits, they will be tough to get, but I'm sure they'll become more popular as more people Anyway guys, let me know in the comment section what you think about Cabby Lake. I honestly think it's pretty this week that they have done this again with this generation of CPUs. Love to hear your thoughts and opinions as always in the comment section. And I'll catch you guys in another tech video very soon. Also, the benchmark PC is done. Though I am having some problems with this 280X. It's like kind of like green screening on me when I'm getting the windows. So I gotta fix that problem, but then the benchmark PC is on its way. It is coming to you guys. Anyway, that's enough of me rambling. I'll catch you in another tech video very soon. Peace out for now. Bye. How's it going, everyone? This is my Lego. Welcome back to my channel. Where today we are going to be scalping my 7700K to release it from the tight grips of the temperature monster. And we are going to deal it using a 3D printed deal it tool. Now before we get to it, check out my Twitter account and consider subscribing for more awesome content if you're not already subscribed. Now let's get the ball rolling. Almost all 7700 and 7600K users might have noticed by now that these chips are pretty hot. Naturally they then consider deleting. Deleting helps reduce temperatures, therefore stabilizing overclocks, making already stable overclocks require less voltage at the same frequency. And last but not least, let us explore new higher frequencies. Here's my baseline, the starting point. This is at 4.9 GHz with a set decor of 1.3 volts and LSC5 giving it 1.28 volts during load. This is very low voltage for overclocking, but look at those crazy temperatures. And here's 5 GHz with 1.3, 4, 5 volts, LSC5 with 1.3, 1, 2 volts during load, which takes temperatures in a matter of seconds to 100 Celsius on the hottest core. Naturally, this is not something that you can work with, and even for day-to-day -day tasks, it would spike up really fast and make the fans start wearing away. You can delete a CPU with different methods, but I went with the delete tool which I got 3D printed. This is not my design and I do not take credit for it. You can get the designs and print it for yourself, check down in the description. I used ABS plastic and this is very important to ensure that the tool doesn't break during the delete. Use a tough plastic or you will accomplish nothing. If you don't have a 3D printer, I don't, then just get someone to print it for you. I paid 14 bucks to print this, so it's far from a fortune. A word of caution about this tool if you're planning to use it. While the base is a very tight fit with the other part, the dimensions are not 100% ready to go. It seems, and I checked this with other people online, that the IHS area is a fraction of a millimeter too narrow to allow it to enter. Fortunately, this is a very easy fix and you just use a knife and scrape off a little excess to the sides until you get a snug IHS fit in there. 
It took me 10 minutes or so, and it was not a big deal. Alternatively, you can opt for other delete tools out there. I'd wholeheartedly recommend their Bower's new Delete Die Mate 2 if you will need to wait until later next month for availability. If not, you can get the Rocket 88 tool, which will also do its job. I thought deleting with the 3D printed tool is more and more appealing to people because of existing designs, reduced splitting costs, and is also safer than pure vice or the vice and block of wood methods. For this, you'll be needing a 3D printed tool, obviously a vice, which you can also get for around $15, just make sure it has at least 3 inches distance between the grips. If you have one lying around and most people either have or can source one for free, then this will limit the investment to the 3D printed tool only. You'll be needing CLU, that's collaboratory liquid ultra gallium liquid metal tin, to use between the bare die and the underside of the IHS. You can also use other gallium based tins, but it seems that CLU works best in regards to durability. If you're doing this for the first time, you'll also be needing a bottle of whiskey and a towel to wipe that excessive sweat off your brow. On the 3D printed tool I used a PU polyurethane gasket, so the CPU PCB would not hit the ABS plastic directly. You can also use some thin rubber for this, it works just fine. Anyway, I started removing the heatsink to get to our today's subject, the 7700K. As you can see, I was already using liquid metal tin, that's a thermal greasy conductor nut if I'm not mistaken over there. Quick clean and we are good to go. Like I said, this is not a perfect fit after printing, but a little work later and you are good to go as well. When you place it inside the vise, make sure that the base of the tool is making good contact with the grip. Don't use a vise that doesn't have parallel grips as a result of a manufacturing flaw. Also make sure that the tool is parallel with the vise body as well. Tightly turn the handle to grip it and then slowly continue applying force. You will feel a resistance, this is normal, don't fret about this. CPUs either make a pop when the glue breaks off the substrate or the IHS just goes loose with no sound. I kept applying pressure and not seeing the PCB move or hitting any pop and actually stopped the camera to see if everything was okay. I then gently knocked on the 3D printed tool with my finger and then pop came the whistle, that's when it happened and we are already done. This was an easy delete, and by the looks of the black glue on the substrate, it's not applied in a thick layer by Intel, but temps were still awful somehow. You can clean the black glue off the parts with a credit card, it'll work wonders. Also, use isopropyl alcohol to clean the leftovers and the dye as well. Quick application of CLU afterwards on the IHS and the bare dye. There's a very thin layer for this, and it's ready to go back inside the motherboard. At this point, you have two options. You can either reattach the IHS or leave it free like I did. If you leave it free, it will be held in place by the motherboard retention bracket and believe me, it won't go anywhere. But if you opt to reattach it, please do not use super glue. Get yourself some black silicone sealant with 10 resistance up to 100 Celsius and apply a very thin layer on the IHS. When you press it down on the substrate, make sure you apply strong and even pressure because if you regenerate the gas that the stock CPU already has, then you're back to square one. This is what I'm talking about. The purpose of deleting is to eliminate the gap generated by the black glue and also use a higher performing tin between the dye and the IHS. Don't generate your own by trying to be overzealous with your black sealant. Moving forward, I align the IHS on the substrate and then lower the retention bracket. Everything's fine and locked into place. I use thermal grizzly conductor knot between the IHS and the Noctua 2 HD15 and let's get the ball rolling and check the temperatures. At the same testing conditions, 4.9 GHz and 1.28 volts during load, we are down to, I don't know, minus 25 to even minus 30 degrees Celsius. That's a freaking difference. 5 GHz at 1.312 volts during load is again showing a staggering difference, of course. But enough of this. What has this? Let me run my chip as a result. I'm 5.1 GHz, 1.39 volts during load, LLC 6, real bench, 8 hours, stable. I'm also EVX stable by using an offset of 1, so essentially 5 GHz. I tested with 4 hours of Prime95 version 28.1, which will hammer those EVX instructions to heaven and back. I call this rock solid stable in my book, and this will be my 24 7 since the voltage is okay. This is not the best chip, but not the worst either. If we look at Silicon Lottery, according to them, only 25% of CPUs will work at 5.1 GHz, so I am now a really, really happy camper. But it can also do 5.2 GHz at 1.44 volts, but it is sadly not 100% stable. 
I would up the V core past this, and I have a feeling that 1.455 volts will give a solid and stable 5.27700K. But I am reaching the cooling capabilities of this here Noctua NHD15 cooler, and again see high temperatures around the 96 to 100 Celsius mark. If I were to get this uh, down to around 85 Celsius or so, it would be 5.2 stable at 1.44 volts. I am quite sure of this. Here it is doing Cinebench at 5.2 GHz and I actually edited and rendered this whole video at 5.2 GHz and had no stability issues whatsoever. I made the switch to this CPU from a 4.6 GHz 4790K. So I have around 7-10% at best IBC improvement alongside a 500 MHz boost. Alongside with faster DDR4 RAM, it was not such a bad deal for me. Let me know what your KB Lake CPUs are running, if you are deleted or not, and thank you for supporting this channel by subscribing. See you next time everybody, bye bye. Now this is a video that I have received many requests to do over the years that this practice has been, I don't want to say commonplace, but definitely something that enthusiasts have been doing. And I am finally, finally going to set aside my concerns about not really wanting people to do this because it can definitely break your CPU and will definitely void your warranty. And I will be showing you guys how to remove the integrated heat spreader or IHS on an Intel Core i7-6700K. TunnelBear is the easy to use VPN service that lets you use the web as though you are in one of 20 different countries. Learn more and try TunnelBear for free at the link in the video description. So I think a natural question to ask is why on earth would you want to remove that, that metal top that protects the die of the processor? Well, the reasons have varied from uh, year to year. So in the olden days it was so that we could actually mount the heatsink directly to the die, eliminating that small uh, thermal resistance that is caused by the IHS itself. But in recent years, starting, I think it was particularly with Haswell, it's become more because Intel has used um, not the greatest thermal compound to attach the IHS to the die itself, rather than soldering them together. So what that worst thermal compound means is that your cooling performance can be affected by that goop. So what people have been doing is instead of leaving the IHS off, They've actually been going as far as to put the IHS back on and just replace the thermal compound. So that's what we're going to be doing today, and we're going to find out if it makes a difference. So to start with, we'll need a baseline. So we're going to take our 6700K, we've just got some Z170 board from MSI going on here. And other than that, this is kind of a janky test bench, and wow, I applied a lot of thermal compound, but that's okay. As long as I do it the same way the second time, then we are freaking golden. So we're just using a stock heat sink. I don't want to sit around and wait for water to warm up and reach equilibrium or whatever else. And frankly, that doesn't matter to get the results that we need because we are looking for an improvement in temperatures, not an absolute value. Let's go ahead and get that puppy mounted. There we go, snapped in place. We're gonna fire this up and then get Ida64 going to find out exactly what our baseline reading is. Benchmarking break. That was a long pizza break. It is actually the next day. I got busy. I had to do WAN show, whatever. You guys don't care about my excuses. What you care about is results. And right here, we've had our test running for about three minutes, and it's running at 70 degrees Celsius here. So that gives us a really good before scenario. Well, before we uh, rip that baby apart. All right, so step one, we're going to pull the CPU off of our test bench here. Put that aside. Next, and this is for the sake of keeping my hands clean, not because it's a uh, hazard to the CPU. We're gonna go ahead and clean off that thermal compound. Don't worry, we'll be reapplying it later. One handy thing about doing this test on this CPU, one that's had thermal compound applied and cleaned off of it many times, is that we're effectively working with a pre-polished IHS. 
So that's another thing that people do sometimes to get slightly better performance. Now with some previous generation CPUs, and I've encountered this before, there were surface mount components, much like you see here, on the top of the package, which meant you had to be extremely careful as you were cutting in between the substrate and the IHS. But that's not the case with Skylake, making it actually surprisingly easy. So you start with the corners. I'm a good gap in that one. We will try a slightly different approach. Holy crap, Ola, that is tight. All right, I think I got it. I just need to get the CPU flat, make sure that I get under metal here. Once it starts to cut, it will cut pretty fast. There we go. See that? Okay, so the adhesive is starting to come starting to come loose. So I'm going to do all four corners, just like that. I really don't want to slice my hand open. It sucks. Once we've done the corners, we're going to go ahead and move the edges. Don't cut too deep. There's really not that much adhesive. All right. Ooh, rock on. So it looks like we are right side up with the notches at the top. We're gonna clean the adhesive residue seal here off of both sides. Then we are going to clean off that thermal compound and replace it with something else. Now I'm just gonna use some Maker Gel that I have lying around, but what a lot of people are doing is they're using like the li that liquid metal stuff or whatever else to get the utmost in performance and then they're actually using an adhesive, like a thermal adhesive, to glue these pieces back together. I'm just gonna be going with the floating method where you don't actually glue them back together. I'm just gonna be doing a chin swap, that is thermal interface material, to find out just how bad the stock stuff is. Well, let's put some aftermarket grade thermal. Wow, so much hail. All right, I gotta clean this again. We'll be back in a moment. Let's try that again. This time, holding down the CPU and putting less thermal content. That's lost. Let's check our orientation. There we go. And so let's find out if she works. Now, because I didn't glue down the IHS, I do have to be pretty careful in my installation here. that. So one tricky bit as we lower the retention arm is you can see these wings right here sit on the integrated heat spreader, the IHS. So we're going to need to compensate by moving it a little bit further back before we tighten this baby down so that it sits in the correct position once the arms are locked. Just like that. So now we're going to reapply our thermal compound. Again, going a little bit heavy, putting a little bit more than I normally would like I did last time. Put our stock heat sink back on. And let's fire up a stress test, shall we, my jabronis? That's right. I'm full of dated words. See if it works? Yeah! All right. That's the first step in success when it comes to trying to improve something, not making it worse or breaking it. Is it safe out Let's let her run until she uh, reaches max temperature and we will come back. So here we are, my friends, the stunning conclusion. It's hovering anywhere from about 66 to about 68 degrees. We'll call that 67. So there you have it, friends. That is ultimately why I have never really condoned the removal of integrated heat spreaders because while you do get a couple of degrees, and if you were using a better paste, you would get a couple more degrees. What you do not get is enough for it to make any kind of significant difference to your overclock or the lifespan of your chip if you're using air or water cooling. So I don't recommend doing it because I don't feel like it is worth the risk of damaging the CPU or the voiding of the warranty of your CPU. So we've got Tesoro here with a pretty freaking awesome giveaway. We've got three of their ex I sense. What are some other decks that we can play in this format now that some cards are banned? <laughs> we can't play those decks anymore. 
Um, well, a lot of these are going to actually be responses to the Sahili Rod combo deck, or at least they will be in the colors that have responses to said deck. So let's start with a deck that seems like it probably won't be a thing because Smuggler's Copter got banned, but still has a lot of good options at its disposal, and that is Mardu Vehicle. What's up, my wizards? It's Dev from SBMTG on the YouTube.com down there with like magic, you know, by now. And today's video was going to be a top eight decks from Pro Tour Aether Revolt, but Mardu Vehicles decided to go ahead and take up six out of those eight slots. So I figured it'd be dumb to do a video where I'm just like, here's the top eight, six of them are the same deck. So today, I'm just going to give you the winning deck list from Pro Tour Aether Revolt, and then my next deck tech is going to be a real.